All right, here we are with David DeHai over at uh, RF Shop down in Australia. David, welcome to the show. Thanks, thanks, Nick. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm super psyched to have you on. I've been watching your videos awesome. and really uh, appreciate the, the kind of no-nonsense approach. And <laughs> that is, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, I don't know, it's a function of probably who you are and your family and where you come from, which is a pretty strong South African accent. But let's start at the very beginning. Um, yes. Are you South African by birth or no? Um, well, it actually is really complicated. So I am South African by birth, as in I was born in a South African hospital. But okay. um, I, my, my parents are Dutch migrants, so my heritage okay. is Dutch, and I grew up with a South African accent in a South African school, but my family is all in the Netherlands. Huh. Um, and then, well, I'm now in Australia, so I know what it's like to be a migrant kid, and I am now a migrant adult, and I'm quite happy to just say, this is it, not moving again. No, you're, you're in, and you're down in the uh, southern part of Australia, down, is That's it Adelaide? We're in Adelaide. Adelaide, okay, cool. Yes, a little country yeah. town. I mean, oh, oops, oh, probably for people are going to be <laughs> quite upset with me, but yeah. it's relatively small, but that's beautiful. It, it's, it's just a beautiful place. And anybody who ever wants to come to Australia, don't stop. Come here and visit as well. Okay, yeah, yeah, noted. I I made the uh, the Eastern Seaboard pilgrimage when I was a, a younger man. I never got down to Adelaide, but it's on oh, the yeah, list. That, so. that is beautiful there, but down here, the, the wine is great. Yeah, uh, they should many pay good me now things for, in Australia. Um, this, this <laughs> selling you. So, anyway, yeah. Um, okay, so you grew up in South Africa, and you went to. Let's get some background on on where you're coming from, because we're going to be talking about uh, radios and radio waves and antennas and mm -hmm. RF, like in general. Is how did you come to that? You went to school, and you I, you got a master's in in this in this stuff. Right? I do actually, yes, yeah. Um, so I went to university, and. Then, Back then and even now still, it's, it's really supported to go to university. So I got an electronics engineering degree. Um, I never saw myself going into computers. Just okay. not, I'm not, I'm a physics person and I love physics and, and the waves and everything that we're going to talk about. It's just really my passion. Um, and and from there in third year, they, they gave us a project and they got us into this anechoic chamber, which is a chamber that you test with. But it's, it's not a small one. It's quite a big one where they do radar tests and stuff like that. And yep. when I walked in there, and I saw all these things, which is, I mean, computers is almost like a small little exciting thing. We have yep. this massive room that is 20 meters size. And you yep. say, well, this thing communicates to that thing. And, and we're trying to figure out how best we can communicate without seeing what's going on. I said, well, that's it. I'm sold. That's um, your gig. And then, okay. Oh, and that yeah. was a, an anechoic chamber. And those typically yeah. are, are kind of sound free chambers. But the way that you're using the word is indicating to me that it's also probably like radio transmission free or, or very um, correct. gated. So you're only dealing with the stuff that's going in there. Is that correct. Right? So, so you, you basically clear out any reflection. So it's you and it's the sender. Well, you being, say, you're the test device on the test and there's the, the transmitter. You yep. look at what's coming from this one to that one and any reflections that could come from the outside gets absorbed by the walls. Yep. Plus also you, you you just block anything from outside that might just interfere with the measurement. So you get a clean result on your antenna as you, well, well, you rotate it and you see. You, you rotate it, you measure what you get, you rotate a bit more, you measure again. And that's how you build that whole radiation pattern picture. The whole pattern that we're going to talk about. Yeah. Okay, cool. So it's basically, it's a test chamber for yep. antennas. That's right. 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 Dig it. So third year, you see that thing and you're like, yep, this is what I'm doing for, for work. And then how, how much longer do you spend in kind of the learning phase before you go out and start to apply it in the, in the, I don't know, business, practical, real world? Should I say 22 years and still going? So <laughs> I'm sure, still yeah, learning. No. Um, now, nah, but, but in your fourth year, then you can do a project. And I, I said, well, my project is going to be in an antenna design, which happened to be 900 megahertz. But back then that was still GSM. So actually, the lessons I learned back then is pretty cool for helium, but that's just a, an aside. And oh. then I, I went on to my master's because I thought, let's get more into it. Um, and, and yeah, it was, it was and just good did. fun. And I mean, when you're 22, you don't feel ready to go work yet. So I'm right. just going to stay at uni. It was, it was just you know, yeah, yeah. extended and then what lunches was and stuff. Yeah, right? Like you're having a good time learning. It's, it's a yeah. great human experience. Um, and then... Is, was there a specific thing you did your master's on? You said antenna design? Uh, you really want me to go to, yes. <laughs> Impedance sure, I'm, I'm, matching. Yeah. So okay. um, my, my fundamental, well, the, the project was impedance matching, which has to mm -hmm. do with how good your device or your radio matches with your antenna. I mean, you've, you've covered that a few times already in other 
conversations as well. So the whole thing of VSWR or return loss or transmitted power into your antenna. I did work on that. Um, specifically at that point, my idea was to take a very basic resonator and try to see can we make it white band. So you have th- something that's not that well matched over a white frequency. And we see if we can do something outside of the antenna, be- between the radio and the antenna, to see can we get more energy over wider frequency into the antenna and what does that do? And you got some good results. Um, so Brad. It worked well. Okay, cool. So I think that that should establish that uh, at least one of us knows what they're talking about and it's not me. So that's super good to have you, have you on this thing. <laughs> So we started this conversation. I'd, I'd seen your videos. I really liked them. Um, we talked a little bit and said, why don't we do some kind of general RF explainer stuff along the same mm-hmm. lines as what I've done with Bennett MP. I think this is really mm-hmm. important to get these, um, these expert, uh, expert level kind of knowledge coming out and cleaning up a lot of the misunderstandings that come out mm-hmm. when, when people like me come in and kind of like, I think I understand it, but I don't always get the whole thing mm-hmm. is making sure that we put out good information to the public so they can make good decisions and yeah. buy the right products or, or not buy mm-hmm. the wrong products. Um, so let's start with the, the one that I get a ton of, yeah. um, this is this tuned antenna ideas. I see this yep. in marketing all the time. It's like, Oh, this mm-hmm. tuned this antenna is tuned. It's going to do really well. Can yeah. you tell me first, what, what is a tuned antenna? Um, yeah, I get the question as well, even yesterday again. So yeah. you basically, as I mentioned, you have two things, white band or narrow band. So that's really to do with the frequency that an antenna can resonate or operate. Um, the first thing is, and, and coming from a 4G perspective, and now 4G slash 5G, mm-hmm. you want an antenna that's white band. So it does pretty much everything because I, as an antenna, supplier can't know where a customer is going to use and the network always switches between say 700 megahertz and 1800 megahertz so the antenna needs to do everything so it's not tuned to anything it's it's kind of tuned to 4g and it's a very broad statement because it's a broad concept for helium and and laura one in general it's 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 a very narrow band so you're really just looking at this narrow window and and i was Mm -hmm. looking at another channel yesterday again which the guy really explained quite well that in Europe, you have the 868 megahertz band and really narrow band that it operates in. The yep. US, US, you guys have 902 to 928 megahertz. So it's, it's a little bit wider, but there's actually two jumps, um, uplink and downlink. And then in Australia, we have 915 to 928. So it's only the upper half of that same narrow band. It's a little tighter, yeah. Um, so what you can do is have one antenna that does everything. So you can create an antenna that does the European bands up to the upper end of the US Australian band. So 870 okay. megahertz or 868 megahertz. And that's that's okay. You can do that. And it's it's still, if I put my 4G hat on, that's quite narrow band. But we can go even further. Um, and we can tune it specific to the US bands, or you can tune it mm. specific to the European bands and say, well, this antenna works really well only in Europe. If you want to use it in the US, it's probably going to suck a little bit. Um, and And... That's really the, the key thing. So I actually am uh, in this context of what people are trying to do in narrow down the performance and get the absolute best. And I, I was thinking how to explain this. Um, and ex- you get three types of antennas, if I could just be like that. A good antenna, a great antenna, and an excellent antenna. A good antenna, maybe, let's say, is, is two to one VSWR. It works okay everywhere. Yep. But if you really want a good antenna, Let's go for 1.5 to 1 VSWR, which is that reflection number you discussed with Ben. Yep. Um, I love to take it one step further because there are so many mainstream suppliers. They all go for 1.5 to 1 and they all say, let's go for a tuned antenna. And I thought, well, if you really want to be different or differentiated, let's go for an excellent antenna. And I love 1.2 to 1. And I got a little cheat sheet here. I can't see anything, but it's a chart of showing what that would mean for you. Um, I mean, Ben discussed as well what VSWR is or return loss. So there's two numbers always flying around, 2 to 1, 1. 1.5 to 1. And then, as I say, I even go further and say, let's go 1.2 to 1. Mm. Um, But if you go further down the analysis, it also has to do with transmitted or reflected power. It's in the same line. So it's the same. um, It's just another way to look at the same thing. And I think this is where people can maybe relate to what, what we're trying to say more. Yeah. Um, so what's interesting is if you say two to one VSWR, you actually say, okay, I'm accepting 11.1% reflection. 
So you are basically only transmitting 80, what's the number? It's 80, 90%. Hang on one second. I want to make sure this is, I want to make sure this is clear for folks who haven't seen the other videos. So what we're talking about is this, this BSWR Vizwar. Vizwar, yep. Yep. And that is in in very general terms, um, the radio sends power into the antenna. The antenna doesn't send all of that power out into the surrounding area. Some of that power gets reflected down into the radio. The it more efficient, yeah, or yeah, it, yeah, it comes back. So the, the more efficient the antenna is, the more of the power it radiates out, so that it's actually usable power. The less Great. efficient it is, the more power gets reflected back and blasts back into the radio. Great. In, Great. in and, um, go ahead. Yeah, no, and, and I think the the way to visualize this is waves. We're always talking about radio waves, and and okay. often in the scientific world, I have to tell people forget about electricity. There's no current flowing, and there are. I mean, you have e fields and voltages and stuff, but it's a wave property and it's, it's a bit like going onto a pool or a river and the river is flowing and like the power is flowing. And if there's an obstruction and you transfer from one point or junction in the river to another one, if that's a smooth transition, everything goes through. But if there's an obstruction, say there's two rocks or so in the way, mm-hmm. only like at that point is going to be some disturbance and you see the wave and then it's, there's a part of the water that's reflecting back. Yep. That, creates a standing wave if you just look at one specific point you see the incoming water that's flowing plus what's coming back and that creates a standing wave yeah it's the same on antennas it just flows into the antenna and then the antenna well, sends it into the wide world yep okay. okay and then the the numbers we've been kind of bouncing around is like somewhere between one and two yeah the, the higher the number the worse it is the lower the yep. number the better it is yep Great. okay good cool and um yeah two to one it seems to be general number that's okay ish but it's it you do accept 11 percent of your power that you're sending is coming back and the same as well um when you receive that that, that you're only receiving 88 89 percent of what's coming the rest is not being transferred into your radio itself yeah okay so it's it's working both ways and then the i guess the other part of this is there's like the geeky side where radio guys want to make sure that they're transmitting as much power as possible to get the clearest signal as possible. But in helium, we have a couple extra things going. We've got the density stuff, which we're probably not going to hit at all in, in this this show. But we also have um, this reasonably narrow band where the radio can't or the signal can't be stronger and can't be weaker than whatever X or Y. I think it's like negative 80 to 122, at least here in the U.S. is the RSSI. We expect that signal to arrive mm. at. And so it can be, it, you, you can have a signal that's too good, right? If you put up a really high gain antenna mm. and you're blasting it out, then that signal can be received at too strong a level and it can appear to be cheating. With a tuned antenna, is that is that a hazard or is that something, well, am I not understanding that right? Okay. Um, I, I guess if you're on the fringe of where it's strong enough, yeah, that, that mm-hmm. could probably, but the thing is, if you if you were to look at the range, Yep. Um, you say you said minus eighty. So I think if you just do a calculation with one of those path loss um, methods, mm-hmm. you'll see that you're probably within that three hundred meter or five hundred meter. You're probably going to be below that anyway, and you right. should be all right. Uh, the, the 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 benefit of a tune antenna would probably be on the lower end because you are better at picking up the lower signals and and just start adding that, and it just kind of has a little bit more efficiency and gets yep. a bit more energy into your a minor and maybe yep. get you that one witness that is like you you keep okay. uh, you refer to that 200 kilometer link that you have up in san diego yeah. yeah yeah that's the difference that that could be the difference between 150 and 200 kilometers is just that little bit of beta antenna and now tuning and and efficiency are two different things right tuning is making sure it's going out efficiently yep. over a very narrow band and then the yep. the visuar side is making sure that all the power that's going out in that band is actually Exiting the antenna, I guess. Yeah, that's probably a better great, way to say it. Great. Yes. Okay. Um, now, the efficiency, there is another thing there. Um, mm-hmm. Well, what I love about some of the antennas that's out there, um, uh, I, I haven't opened many antennas. I've, I've opened the one that we sell because I <laughs> want to know what's in this thing. Sure. Um, but you get PC board based antennas, yep. like computer, like printed circuit board, um, which is nice. That's an easy, it's a easy way to manufacture things. Um, and it is also a very, um, effective way to get wide band performance because you control a lot of fancy structures and techniques. But the PC board material by itself can also be lossy and it probably is a little bit lossy with where efficiency comes in. So okay. we look at the VSWR of 1.5 to 1 
but your antenna is only sending out still a low number because all the power gets absorbed in the antenna. That is possible. So it's something which we probably can't control. And, and as an end yep. user, you have no knowledge. You just then you have to look at where do you buy an antenna from? Is this a good, good, um, reputable product and stuff like that? And, and go yep. buy market feedback. Um, I mean, Ben, I, uh, I know you mentioned spec sheets. So yeah. if you look at a company like this, it's a reputable type of product. So, you know, you're not going on eBay or Amazon and just buy the nearest and best antenna that promises you the world. Right. Are there, um, I don't know if I had this in the questions. Are there, um, or what are the manufacturers? Because you, I mean, you run RF shop. What you do is you sell antennas and other, I'm assuming, radio equipment in the general Australia kind of area mm -hmm. and maybe worldwide as well. Um, uh, what are yeah. the manufacturers, the brands that you're like, yep, you can pretty much trust these guys to always do a good job? Um, well, we have a very strong relationship with a um, company, a South African company, but they actually are global footprint right now. It's pointing antennas. Um, okay. And they play very hard and very good in the um, 4G slash 5G world in the marine yep. industry, um, uh, rural rural, and, and, and um, rough um, mining industry. Yep. Um, and they also have some antennas in, in the, um, well, that covers the helium frequency band. But yeah, yeah. And that's P-O-Y-N-T-I-N-G, right? Pointing? Yeah, yeah, great. Yep. Okay. And they, they now have an office in Texas as well. So um, Okay, um, cool. But then, of course, the one that a lot of people talk about and we also sell is McGill. Um, mm -hmm. McGill Microwave. It's a good antenna. It has a very good name here in Australia, and, and we've had yeah. quite a good run with them as well. So, and then there's, a, there's <laughs> I'd say there's a new kid on the block here in Australia, um, RF Shop. <laughs> we also got, got one in, and, and it's... It's just to also have have some options, yeah. um, as I say that that's just to get into the knowledge of what's going on. Um, at the moment, we we specifically tuned to that very narrow Australian band, um, so it's just to get some options out there as well. Um, cool. I'll have to send you guys out an H antenna and see what you think of it. I got yes, yeah, no, I got I'd, at least one extra that. one. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Yes. That's, it was super cool to go to their shop because they're in Ohio, which is kind of middle mm -hmm. America, and, and just see how they made them and, and how they put them together. I, I think we've done one video where Ben took it apart, but I'll, yeah, I'll um, I'll buy one and send it out, to, or I'll get one and send it out to you. I'll probably buy one and send it out to you. Um, okay, so let's talk about kind of this gain idea where people think first off, bigger is not better, um, or I mean, maybe maybe you're thinking it is in in the world of helium, bigger is not better because typically it's just uh, narrowing that that band where it's kind of pushing energy out yeah. and you might miss some stuff that's near to you. Now, I hmm. think it was you that did, that did the math and said, look, you're not really going to miss stuff that is super near. Um, even hmm. like a nine DBI antenna is if it's a hundred feet up, it's still going to hit the ground within like 700 feet. You guys do meters, right? So it's like 30 meters and out to whatever yeah. that is the meters. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it, the, the, there's, there's many things to that. Um, okay. The first thing is that you need to go further and further from the antenna. To, to really get a problem in terms of the sensitivity. So the one thing about overshooting, I mean, a lot of people talk about overshooting, but yeah. you need to be, but officially, you need to be 300 meters or more away from the next miner. That, yep. that, that's the official guideline. And if you, that, that's what I did in that video. It's just had a bit of a look at that, uh, the trigonometry. Yeah. And you're really almost hitting the ground anyway on one of those high gain antennas by the time you are 300 meters away. Yep. So that's fine. It's, it's, it, so, in that conversation, I'm saying I don't see the issue with going with high gain antennas. Yep. However, I'm also thinking it's overrated. And then I think you mentioned this a few times as well that, yeah, you go for 9 dB antenna and a lot of people go for 9 dBi antennas. It, 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 it complicates it more than it helps you because it's a longer antenna. You, yep. you might even have be close to that EIRP legal limits as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's specifically thinking about Europe and, and also here in Australia, you, you're you already hitting above 30 dBm. So I don't think it's always worth it. In fact, I rarely think it is really worth it to, to go for anything more than six because the six has a happy medium where yeah. if you do an installation, the thing is kind of at an angle a little bit, it's probably quite forgiving. When you have a nine dBi and this thing is not perfectly lined, you might just, you know, Oh, interesting. Piece. So you so could overshoot if it's not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it really goes, goes wopsided. Yeah. Um, let's see. So another question that I've got is, is there a, a giant range difference between a low gain and a medium and a high gain antenna? And I'm not seeing one, but I'm not a radio guy. Huh. I'd love huh. to hear it from someone who knows what they're talking about. Um, 
uh, the, 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 the basic rule of thumb is, is 6 dBi or 6 dB in general is double distance. So between Over 3 zero. and 9, if everything okay. is perfectly aligned on uh -huh. the horizon, you probably could get double distance. But okay. then like, it's really one of those all stars need to align. Everything looks to be correct. Um, one thing that I am... Um, now, I'm, I'm trying to tell people a lot, and I, I think that that's been mentioned a few times also with um, your conversation with Ben, is um, height is your friend. So yeah. you get a 9 dB antenna, but you still have this hill in front of you. It, it's absolutely not going to help you. And then when you get to those distances like you had 200 kilometers, Earth curvature becomes an issue yeah. because you really you can't see the horizon anymore because literally Earth is your obstruction. Yeah. And then you need to go higher in order to see that. So that point of diminishing returns and, and 6 dBi is, to me, in, in 4G world even, um, or in 4x4, when, when we talk with people about their, um, their boosters and they want to have something on their, um, their pickup truck, their ute, or whatever you want to call it these days, yeah. what country it's listening to. Yeah, um, yeah. It, the, the car is constantly moving. Same mm -hmm. with the boat. The boat is always moving and rocking. If you go too high in your gain, you know, you're constantly going to have, yeah, I have a good connection, and then suddenly there's a wave, and you, and your you connection don't. goes up and down the whole time. So yeah. physics oh, tells me always 6 dBi is actually a very sweet spot number. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that 3 dBi shot from southern San Diego up to uh, north LA, it's yeah. A, it's on like a two and a half story building. It's on a yeah. 23 foot pole on top of that building on my side. On the far side, that hot spot is up on a, I don't know, a 2,000 foot maybe a 3000 foot, a thousand meter mountain. Yeah. Um, that's it's, I use it as like, Hey, I don't see any practical reason to not use, or, or I don't see any practical reason to use a high gain antenna, right? If you're in the geeky radio world and it's not helium, a hundred percent, there's great reasons to use high gain antennas, a very specific use cases where only a high gain antenna will do, or only a directional or a sector sector or Yagi or whatever it is yeah. will do. But in the world of helium, man, most of our best connects are within 10 to 30 kilometers yeah. and a three DBI seems to do that. No problem. So yeah, somewhere between three and six DBI. And if like, I guess yeah. if you're going into a situation blind and you're saying, what's the, the antenna that's most likely to be the happy medium is a six. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds totally reasonable yeah. to me. I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm then also putting my perspective of a IOT radio guy here that, yeah. that I'm really excited about the IOT network. So I mean, crypto is a big thing for most users at the moment, but yep. I'm excited about what, what's going to happen with the Helium oh, network. It's so cool. And then yeah. the 3 dBi makes more sense because you yep. want you want everybody in your hex and a bit further to really get their devices on your um, on your hotspot eventually when, yep. when all these things start to happen. So then 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 overshooting becomes a problem because, yes, your, your miner doesn't connect to that one, but you're also not seeing the guys right under you that has all the IoT devices. So... Yeah. yeah. And uh, let's see, Neil, BFG Neil was saying something about, I didn't, I've got to follow up with him. Um, something about the high gain antennas don't, I'll butcher this, but they don't receive the sensor signals as well as another type of antenna. Cause I think it was the spreading factor issue. Does that make sense? Or am I, I'm probably butchering the explanation. So it, <laughs> he's a pretty smart guy. I'm sure it makes sense. I just don't yeah, understand yeah, yeah. it. I'll, I'll have to study that one as well. I'm, 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 I'm really the, well, all, full disclosure, I'm, I'm really studying Laura Wan now to get my head around all the um, the nitty gritty of the um, signal processing side as well. But yeah, I, I think low is better, low and yeah. some gain, uh, some height. So that those are the two things. Yeah, elevation is, is going to be crushing yeah. there. Okay, yeah. um, how does we talk about gain all the time? We throw it around as a term: high gain, low gain. You know, yeah, yeah, whatever, yeah. better or less. Like, how does it actually work? Like, what? Yeah, what? What goes into getting more gain? Yes, um, that's a good question. So I did a video right in my early days of YouTube where I used a balloon to explain mm -hmm. the concept of an omni. So, and literally, I might just refer back to that at some stage, but sure. coming out of your radio, and another thing, I'm always, or people are always talking about sending because it's just mm -hmm. easier to explain what's happening when you send stuff. But yep. the reciprocity with antennas, that's the term to you. So the same happens coming in. So yep. I'll just explain it from a sending perspective. So your radio is sending X amount of power. And it's kind of mm -hmm. just, that's that's the entity. And then we have this DBI, I is isotropic. So it refers to something that's zero, well, ball. So when we add gain, we basically change and manipulate the shape of that balloon so that it goes more in one direction 
Mm -hmm. And like you were on the video, I just squeezed the balloon to say, well, if you press it at the back, you take away from the gain at the back and it starts to move forward in a Yagi yep. perspective. And yep. Omni is the same. You have this ball and you you squeeze it from the top. So you have this balloon shape. So it 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 squeezes out more yep. gain to the sides, but you're taking away from the air that, that's currently at the top and bottom. Sure. And then if you squeeze it more, higher gain, it goes further and further. But there, that energy doesn't get created. It's just reshaped reposition reshaped yes yeah yeah now is there a specific way that manufacturers do that on an antenna because we see four foot antennas and two foot antennas are, are there ways where they're like a shorter wire somehow gives you better gain like how does it like the physicality of it yeah okay so um in, in an antenna um we we build arrays arrays is basically a, a bunch of the same kind of element together and then in the mm -hmm. physics world and that's the kind of stuff that you learn when you go in um in <laughs> master's degree and, and and university and so forth yeah if yeah. you have more multiple elements on top of each other you mm -hmm. change the overall shape of what comes out of the combination of all of these antennas so one antenna one dipole um which is in in 900 megahertz is about 15 centimeters long mm -hmm. that does that two dbi the typical um uh, what do we call donut shape? Then you have yep. two of those on top of each other, plus they are combined. Mm -hmm. um, then it, it, it goes roughly double the size, so roughly three dB more. And it, it's really just a rough rule of thumb, but yep. that kind of size, which is about 30, 30 ish centimeters, that yep. could get you that five dB on number. And then to go three dB more, in other words, you have to have four elements on top of each other. Another three dB that gets you the eight. So that's kind of the size physics factor that that that's at play here. Um, and, and that's so, really, yeah. let's see. I was guys, I've seen uh, antennas pulled apart where you see that the PCB stuff on the inside, and it's like, yeah, every fifteen centimeters, there's another yeah. whatever this thing is, and then there's like a yellow piece of plastic or whatever connecting it to the next thing. It looks a little bit like some of the LED lights we've seen for us, for mm. us non-technical people. Um, that's what it reminded me of. So. Is there a way then to have a super short antenna have super high gain, or is that just physically not possible? Or do you need to have? Is there something else that goes into that? Um, it's not really possible. Um, you you okay. often see people promise the world from an antenna gain perspective, sure. and you see a lot in four G that you have on. Uh, you could go on eBay and you just do a search for four G antenna, and you'll get these small rectangular antennas. Yeah, I mean, I don't like to bash other but that's one that i really want to buy i did it on youtube once as well you have this small little thing um and i promised 49 dbi gain i said well that seems that's, excessive. that's not even i mean that's not even funny anymore it, it is really right. just bs um yeah. but 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 in the helium world you kind of really just have to look at the physics is this really looking sensibly long and if yep. somebody does say this is an 8 dbi antenna and yeah it's half the size of the other 8 dbi antennas there's a big red flag um, okay, cool. The, so, I mean, maybe it's possible in some like crazy DARPA lab, they figured something out to make it different. But for the stuff that we're going to buy, if yeah. you're getting a higher gain antenna, it mm -hmm. should be longer. Yeah, I mean, we're relatively low cost in the helium projects. We're not going for these multi thousand dollar kind of designs that, that they, you know, when they, when they send stuff, the NASA sends stuff into space, they, they probably go really crazy and funky on stuff they can do. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you have an antenna. Once it launches into free space, literally, so you have, let's say I have a hypothetical antenna here. Yep. You can do funky stuff in here. But the yep. moment the wave gets launched and it goes there, you have no control over what happens. And there, once it's here, like, like you can do what you want in the structure. Once it releases, whatever, you, how you want to yep. see it, physics dominates. Then you still want to see that this is an antenna that has that size that gets launched and then you can't control that. And that's why physics is just always going to, um, to rule in, in this, this kind of setup. Sure. It's going to help us understand and it really helps us kind of make good decisions. So you see a mm. super high gain antenna, it's super short. It's it, the easiest thing to do is to go look for another antenna. Yeah. So, um, so that, 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 um, I think on, on the video, you had the H antenna from Ben, uh, or he yeah. opened it up and it's not just length. Often it's 3D volume. So, I mean, with these type of antennas, length, because you, you kind of just have length to play with, but yep. you often do see that it might be shorter, but yep. if they are actually doing something more in the other axis, so make it a 3D, then then actually, so it's not just length or height, it's it's yeah. just looking at the whole 
Yeah, yeah, because he's got one that's like it's like three little mm -hmm. wires that mm -hmm. stick out if you pull the yes. top off of it, which yeah. is yeah. That's a beautiful I design. I, I looked at it and I thought, yeah, I know what they're doing and I like it. So <laughs> yeah, it's cool. It, they've got such a cool story, mm -hmm. the uh, mm -hmm. the whole backstory and the patents of the guy who designed it, and yeah, super cool stuff. Okay, so let's take a, like a little bit of a detour here. Is RF shop is not your only gig? Like you're running this shop, no. but you also and that's just selling antennas to people who are doing whatever they're doing. You're also running uh, Black Art Technologies. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, my, my background is antenna design, and my passion is, apart from educating through stuff like YouTube, is, is just playing and designing antennas. Um, we're, I guess we're relatively small, but I shouldn't say that anymore these days. I mean, we, we just do what we do and we're having fun at it. But yep. Black Art Technologies does custom antenna design. Um, what it means is you get the mainstream antenna designers, you get yep. like McGill H antennas and, and all those companies pointing antennas. They yep. do their big stuff. I enjoy having custom antenna designs for customers. So it is it's more project thing. driven yeah. where they say, I need an antenna, but it needs to fit in this box. It needs to do these things. And then we work with them and it's specific for their application. The, the fun or the good part of that is they can deal with all the mechanical complexities. We just have to do the antenna electronic design for them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then we have a team of um, yeah some in, antenna engineers as well. People just as crazy as me who, who like the black art of, of um, technologies. And, and we, we run simulations, we do tests and um, it just, use that in those applications and it's good fun it's it's and it keeps us you know it, it, it kind of marries up with um not just selling antennas for the sake of selling antennas but but we really keep keep focus on the science behind it as well and that those two together just has, a, has quite a nice um match yeah and i mean those aren't like low those aren't cheap antennas right that's not like a hundred dollar antenna someone's no. going to pay some some not serious good. money for that and they've got some serious reason to use it so okay good. cool um is there for let's say for the uh, au you guys are au 915 or is it au yeah. 928 uh, nine, 915 it's called au 915 but it actually that's the starting frequency for us it's 15 to 28 okay yeah is is there a perfect length for that that people should look for like hey if it's beyond this or under this or yeah, how do you think of that in terms of length of, an, of antenna? Yeah, that's a hard one because I, I guess you, you, well, the radar is the thing that covers the antenna, and you don't know how much headroom they leave inside the antenna itself. If I literally just get this McGill back in my in my hand, yeah, I don't know where the actual antenna stops here. So they probably just have. If if I were them. Yep. Um, I would just have a stock standard length of this. And then for yep. Europe and for the US and Australia, I would just use different insight, but to, to make things simpler. So they probably all look similar to this. But okay. if maybe to, to answer your question without going technical, that length, 60, 60 centimeters roughly, that, that, that's where right. 60 BI would look. Would ah, okay, be. cool. So you, you may have something that looks a lot longer than the actual antenna is because the radome is the thing that, you know, they, they want to pump out whatever, 30,000 of those things. And then yeah. inside each of those tubes, they put a different actual antenna. They may all look the same, but they'll perform differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you do see when you sure. open up some of these, there's, there's sometimes a bit of foam or just some empty space. Yeah, just nothing in there. Okay, no. we, we got to cut some more antennas open there. We got to see what's going on in these things. <laughs> I'm not promoting that, but it's a good hobby. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's fun stuff. Yeah. Okay, so you're a total antenna geek. Like you probably have a whole shop full of, of antenna testing equipment. Is there a way when someone gets an antenna, whether they buy it off of eBay or they buy it from you guys or from whoever, to, to do like a basic function check? You know, just like you buy a new car, like you put the key in, you turn it on, you know, yeah. the car works. Is there a way to check an antenna? Um, well, first of all, there's a way not to check an antenna, um, okay. and that's just put a multimeter on. Um, I have seen posts and somebody put a, a, a multimeter on, and he, he basically lashed out on on Facebook saying, "This antenna's utter utter nonsense. I just bought it on eBay, and it's not working. It's shorted." And then somebody else was saying, "Now you need to you measure 50 ohm resistance," and and it's kind of you just sit there and think, oh, "That's not going to work," because we're working in an RF radio frequency world, so. Put that multimeter away. You know, it's a, you sometimes have antennas that have short circuits in them. Sometimes right. have antennas that are open circuit. I'd be surprised if you ever see something that measures 50 ohm DC resistance because that's just not the way it works. 50 ohm in our huh. RF world is is 50 ohm. It's it's a radio term. It's not a DC DC um resistor term. 
Um, oh, okay. Huh. Other than that, I think it's very hard. We have test equipment called Vector Network Analyzers, VNAs. Yep. Um, and you, I think you've, you've actually, um, you have a few of those as well that you showed on one of your videos. I got the little cheap ones. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm just like, oh, I'll buy this thing off <laughs> and I'll test it and see if it works and see if, and, and it, you know, the ones I have, I think <laughs> I might have bought one where it's like, ooh, this is not working well. But everything else, it seems to be working. I don't, but I don't have a, you know, I don't have like a test lab to actually check it. So I guess that's a the great question is, let's say you've got, I don't know, $500 to spend on test equipment. Is there something that you could recommend and say, buy this? Or is it just like, it's not even worth it to buy it if that is your budget? Where would you weigh in on that? Um, I would, I, I, Antenna Geek talking here, I, I would buy yeah. one. Um, See, I, I actually, when I when I started out of shop or when I took over out of shop here in Australia, I did buy myself one of those cheap ones in the early days because I thought I have to get something to get testing. So sure. I think it was Nano VNA. It was with a blue yeah. little blue plastic box, and yeah. it did the job. But it was really yeah. slow when you when you scanned through. It just really went slow through the, the plots, and and I just I get a bit impatient having to wait for that whole curve. And sure. then when you touch touch the antenna, it takes a whole cycle before you can see what was the effect of it. Yeah. Um, we now have, um, we actually have it on our website. There's a, a Dutch company, MagicQ. Um, they have nice little VNAs. Um, okay. Works really well. Goes up to six gigahertz. So for us, that's beautiful. For helium, probably don't have to go for anything that goes above one gigahertz because it's not not necessary. Doesn't matter, right? Um, but VSWR measurement is my go-to measurement to check an antenna. Other than that, if you are patient and willing to wait, I would put it on a miner um, and see what happens. Um, one thing that I am learning and I'm still kind of just learning as I go. So this video is, is kind of me being a student in helium world as well. Sure. Still. Yeah, yeah. Um, but when I look, I'm oh, sorry, I'm just pointing to a screen because I have helium explorer open in front of me there. Um, yeah, yeah. if you look at your witnesses and you, you go into detail, there's always that, um, RSSI and signal to noise number. Yep. It's kind right. of useful. And I, I, I actually want to create a video. I want to study it more and create a video to say, well, can give you an indication how things are not not perfect not good but if if you have a witness that is 10 well let's say five kilometers away but the number is yep. very low something's wrong and, and it's right. kind of i just want to draw a table and say well sensible numbers should be this for this distance if not your antenna might not be as good as your or the other guy's antenna is, is bad, but something in that link between you and him is 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 broken. Or there's a massive tree between you. <laughs> One yeah. of those. Okay. So you're saying if if you got five hundred bucks and you just you really want to burn it, buy one of the nano VNAs, but it won't be pro quality, which is I mean, I think most of us have that decent understanding. Yeah. But I, the I other way is just maybe you have a friend that has one. <laughs> just go go to a friend. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting thing because we all get into it. We get so excited, and you see some of this stuff, and it's like, oh, I can spend six thousand dollars on a machine, or I can spend one hundred fifty. Like, I'll try the one hundred fifty dollars one, just see yes. if it works first. Oh, I was um, there as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've we've all all started somewhere. Yeah. But you're saying is like, hey, just plug it into the miner. Um, and there's also, I guess, the other thing I'm hearing is there's not an easy, cheap way to do a function check on antenna. No. On no, an antenna. No, no. Okay. All right, so that, that's just like an unreasonable ask. I, it um, would be, it would be, yeah. and that that that's where it that does make a lot of sense for the majority of users to maybe just go for a reputable brand. Um, right. That that's yeah. the safe way to do it. I mean, if you don't want to spend five hundred dollars, then spend hundred dollars on a good antenna and save you four hundred dollars, and you have peace of mind. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I do it both ways because it's just it's fun to mess around. But I, I'm with you there. It's just like, hey, yeah, 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 yeah. buy one of the high quality antennas, get the McGill, get an H antenna, get something where it's like this oh, is what they do. They're they're super <laughs> well known, or a, a pointer, or something yeah. from RF shop. One of yours uh, for sure. Mm. Um, and then don't don't worry about it. But the thing I noticed with antennas in helium is that it's the only only thing people can really affect. It's the only thing people can change. They, yes. You can't get into the miner. You can't fiddle with the ECC chip. You can't do any of that. Like there's nothing else you can do other than the antennas. So in my, from my kind of perspective, having been in it for a while now, it's like this thing that makes the smallest amount of difference, but people put the most energy into it. And so it's totally off kilter where the thing that makes the biggest, the single biggest difference you can make with your helium miner is to put it in the right location. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then you could have a coat hanger and, Maybe not quite that extreme, but you could. You could well, I, I must say that when I got my first miner, which was Heltec, um, that mm -hmm. came with the stock antenna. 
Yep. I, I couldn't be, I, I can't wait. I just have to turn this thing on and get, get going on, on it. And yep. I got some witnesses. I got some results. It's not great, but it was up and running. Um, the yeah. cable is too very, very weak. Um, yeah. I mean, that's the other thing that, that you, you talk about antennas. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe not for this conversation, but cables and connectors and the quality of those. It's just incredible that you could you can do really bad things on your good antenna if you have a poor cable connection between them or too long or stuff like that. So it's that whole chain from the output of your miner through to whatever yep. comes to the antenna. Yep. Interesting. I mean, the, the, I guess the short takeaway there is do a little bit of Googling and, and check the cable loss and make sure you yep. know what cable you have and check the loss that you've got. And once you do that, it's generally okay. But what I found is that a lot of the stuff is just, it's, it's math and it's science and it's really confusing for people. And they just say, you know what? I, I just, I don't have time for it. You know, like, just tell me what to do, yeah. which is fine. Like everybody's got their own thing to, to figure out. Um, yeah. All right, let's do lightning arresters. Cause I'm sure we both get a bunch of questions about that. Hmm. Um, I guess the, the right thing to say is always put a lightning arrestor in your chain. Um, that is kind of generally accepted advice. Although I also say that doesn't appear to be generally accepted practice. When I look at antennas on top of buildings, yeah. um, I've seen lots of antennas that don't have anything in there, any, any kind of uh, surge protector in there. Um, so yeah, your, your mileage may vary. What you should do is put one in there. Should you put it closer to the antenna or closer to the, to the hotspot or does it matter? Um, see, I'm, I'm actually also there trying to get my head around, we, 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 here in Australia, we have the Australian standards, um, and mm. I'm trying to get my hands on the official standards so I could study the, the recommended proper way for telecom setups. My okay. gut feel tells me you want to get it as quick as, as close as possible to the ground. Um, there was one person who asked me once, uh, how about two? And it doesn't really, um, sound huh. too bad either. To, to have one at the antenna, one at the ground, but maybe too complicated. So I would put it close to the ground as possible. Yeah. Um, I know in, in, in the, um, when I did some work in, in, in the telecoms world, to, the 4G stuff and so forth, that you yeah. even have these cable clamps. So you ground your cable all along the tower going up. So that's, that's going one step oh, further. The whole way. But, yep. Yeah. Yep. So earthing and grounding and lightning protection is a massive thing. And, and back then, I mean, this, this is not what, typically it gets done in helium it's a small scale project but you have yeah. helium um lightning protectors you know you have those little huts i guess you have the same in the u.s as well so inside the hut would be the racks and everything yeah, yeah. Um, and the cable comes down the tower or whatever and then at the entry you want the lightning protector in that instance on the outside before the cable goes into the hut inside yeah because yep. it basically prevents whatever lightning strike or just just you know, energy build up static electricity to, to, yeah, yeah go to ground and not get yep. into the equipment. I yep. apply the same logic in you know, my my world here for, for helium. Is it's basically, yep. and it, it, it could cause a problem because if you look at the typical lightning protector kits, it's always yep. a lightning protector that the only way to where you place you can put it is at the antenna. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that's what I started doing. I, I'm actually yeah. going to fix this blog post because we're yeah. all learning as we go. But yeah, yeah. okay. But my, my, my gut feel is, and this is really what I want to study better, is I would think, um, well, I'm going to put it out there now at the moment, I guess, is an antenna, a cable. Mm -hmm. Then at the cable at the bottom, there's a break to get your lightning protector in and then yep. make the link to your route, your um, your miner. That, that's how I would, my gut yep. feel says how it should be. Yep, I'm on board with that. That makes a lot of sense to me as well. And I think that's what I've heard the ham guys say. And, mm. You know, mm. the, the nice thing is like you get in, you get the ham dudes in and, and they're just so psyched on this and they've been oh, yeah. geeking out on radio for so long that mm. it's that's kind of the easiest thing to do. Yeah, we, we, um, when, um, the very talkative customers when we, they come to RF shop to buy cables, they they, they love talking about their hobbies. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you ever like need to kill an hour, go talk to a ham guy about radio. Oh, yeah, yeah. That'll chew yeah, up that whole hour. No it, it's kind of you just need to turn the, the handle and they 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 keep going. So. They go for it. It's <laughs> That's awesome. Funny. Yeah. Fountain of information. Um, okay, let's let's start to kind of wrap up on one of the other things I see all the time, which is how do you how do you read the antenna radiation pattern? Um how do you read that chart? As I've had a couple of questions is like, I see the chart, it's this big round circle and I yep. see a couple of circles and squiggles on it. Like what, what am I looking at? Okay. So I, I actually, I think I addressed this in it to some extent in one of my videos as well. Yeah. Um, oh, it, yeah. It's you basically, if you want to read it, you need to put yourself in that middle of the chart. So you are there, you are sitting there and this is you. Mm -hmm. And 
it's not like this thing is actually going yeah this, this, there was a video that i saw that just got me going it says up and over so it's some some conception out there that that when antenna radiates and you want to go over building you look at the logo in antenna because it goes up and over and as a, uh, well, again it's like a what really it's not, this is not gonna work um yeah. you you stand in the middle and you see the gain on the horizon of that chart for instance at zero degree and that's the number that's how strong i'm gonna get the string here so there yep and then you look a bit up say you look 30 degrees up you look at the chart you see the number there it looks like it makes a bubble but the gain is that much lower so yep. that's how much gain it would be in that direction and then the next one is say 45 degree you read what's that number and then in that direction from where i am that's the that's gain the number. so that's how you build it up right so it's not the path of the signal it's the strength of the signal that yeah yeah, yeah. At. yes yes okay and i mean that and that translates to pattern so pattern and strength is just the the, the way that it, it gets used and the misconception about up and over that's just totally not totally wrong All right that's just people yeah. who don't understand it yet okay cool yeah. so and then there's two things that you typically see on a chart sometimes you see two charts sometimes you see one chart with with two different colored lines oh, yeah. on it and one of them is from basically a vertical um, oh, yeah. okay. perspective and one is from a horizontal yeah a little prop again there you go okay so we we have two things well if if it's a really technical chart you they would call something azimuth and elevation um yep. azimuth would just be you look at it this way so if they look like this there's a radiation pattern that it's just ideally yep. it's a perfect circle so you have this thing and it probably yep. won't does everything all around exactly the same yep. but then the elevation is basically elevation is like how does it look over the height so on the horizon yep. it works at its best go but up it goes a bit it's a bit weaker and then at the top it probably should be at a totally weakest position and then you build that that um plot up in, in at yep. the end of the day okay cool super super easy so just and some of this stuff is just getting the chart you know printing it out or looking out of the screen and kind of trying to make sense of it but basically you're mm -hmm. looking at two different ways you're looking at mm -hmm. it from the top of the antenna looking down on it and you're looking from the side of the antenna looking mm -hmm. out to the sides mm -hmm. okay Super cool. Thanks a ton for going through all that and explaining that. Is there anything else that um, that you see as maybe a common misconception or something? Anything else you want to talk about about kind of RF and the and the helium world? Um, there's actually so much happening, and I think it it, it is awesome. Um, I I think for me, I'm happy to see warm earnings on my miner, but the focus is so much on the IoT and 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 where yeah. this is heading. And I, I think we're yeah. all building this awesome network, and and then yeah. just because it keep your eye on the ball it's 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 really this iot network that's building and if everybody works together as a community um and not be greedy and say i just want to do this and i want to pump in amps and we didn't talk about amplifiers and stuff but um no, no, no. I, I, I can only say one thing and that's don't yeah, <laughs> that's yeah this is a short answer um and if everybody just does everything according to the rules it's going to be a sweet system it's going to be really cool yeah no, it, it's it's very very cool, and I think the helium helium team and the community at large is is just like every other group is, you know, ninety five percent, ninety eight percent really good people, and then one yeah. percent people who don't care, and one percent people who are uh -huh. trying yeah. to screw the system over. That's just that's humans. That's how we do it. Yeah. So, yeah. luckily, most people are are pretty good. Cool. Well, I think that's a a nice wrap, David. Thanks so much for your time and for coming on and for sharing that knowledge. It's it's really nice to hear it from someone who who studied it professionally and is not kind of guessing like uh, like a lot of us, including myself, are are where we kind of read something. You can make sense of it. None of this stuff is is insensible, but really good to hear it from an expert. So thank you. Yeah. Th thanks. And, and and I think I can maybe speak of on behalf of all the professionals that um, our doors, our phones, our emails are always open and available. So if there's any questions, any uncertainty. Um, it's better to ask. There's no such yeah. thing as a stupid question. So just just ask, and then we'll work together. And yeah, it's it, it's fun, but but we're all learning together on how to do this thing. Love it. Yeah, I think that's as good a place as any to wrap up. Right on, man. Cool. Thanks, Nick.